the gospel written by Apostle Matthew, chapter 7, and we're going to read from 1 to 12. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. What is Jesus talking about here? We need to understand that there is this pharisaical system that was so, you know, powerful at the times of Jesus that there was this class of people, religious peoples, religious leaders who were always considering themselves above everyone else and they were looking down on people, okay? So the whole passage, almost all of the teachings of Jesus are contrasting or are teaching about the contrast between the pharisaical hypocrisy and the kingdom concerns, okay? The pharisaical hypocrisy and the kingdom concerns. The Pharisees were hypocritical in the sense that they, were, they considered themselves to be leaders. They considered themselves to be leaders of the people, teaching them rightly and so on and so forth. But in fact, they were not. They were exploited. So here, as Jesus is teaching about all of these things, we need to understand the... Two groups of people that are there, right? And Jesus is talking to his disciples. Matthew chapter 5 starts this way, that the whole lot of crowd are there. And then, you know, the disciples came with Jesus. And he's talking to this group of people, the core group of people that Jesus wants to impart his kingdom values into. So if we are people who follow, our, we are followers of Christ, if we are disciples, then these are the teachings that are given so that we will understand that we are not supposed to be fitting into the patterns of this pharisaical hypocrisy, but rather Rather have the kingdom concern, all right? So here he is saying, do not judge. Can we say this? You can't judge. What is judgment? Can we judge? We shouldn't judge. Is there something called right and wrong? Is there something called morality? So something was wrong. Are you supposed to call it wrong? Aren't you supposed to do that? Will that not be judgment? Can we judge? Judgment is a part of justice, right? Just judgment is a part of the justice system. Justice system is that everybody is equal. Someone does something wrong. Someone does something exploitative. Someone becomes a victim. Someone becomes a perpetrator. And then there, there, there is the judgment which is given so that the perpetrator will pay. So that the victim will not be penalized and victimized for being a victim. You understand that? So judgment is definitely a part of the justice system. And it's an ideal for God himself. So judgment is, is God. It's ideal. It's good. So why would Jesus say, do not judge? What do you think? So immediately we know that he's not going to contradict himself. He's not going to contradict the nature of God or the ideals of God. When he says, don't judge, what is he trying to say here? So it is not about the judgment which is based on justice or for the uplifting and, uh, and establishing or maintaining justice. What is Jesus saying here? The next passage qualifies what he's saying. It is giving, it's, it's, it's teaching us, it's giving an explanation of this because this passage he is talking about, you have a plank on your eye, but you are looking for a speck in another person's eye. So it is not out of concern. Justice is out of concern. Judgment, true, just, true judgment or good judgment is about equality because you have concern. You understand that? You see some wrong thing that is going on. There is a perpetrator who is victimizing a victim and you are supposed to go and stand against the perpetrator and for the victim whereby you have already judged that the other person who is perpetrating this crime is in the wrong and you, you, you tell that person you're not supposed to do that. You stand against that person. That is because why do you do that? Why should we do that? Because of, because of concern, right? That is justice. But yeah, the story is very different. You have a plank on your eye. You don't want anybody to look at you and find fault with you. So what you do is, you are in the wrong. So the best thing would, to do is that you find fault with somebody so that your wrong is not going to yeah, be highlighted. It's not going to be conspicuous. It's almost like throwing the first stone. You understand that? The first person who raises their voice in an argument, is going to be the winner. Yeah? And especially on the road, if you drive, you know, right? 
the person who's able to lift their hands like that, even if they go the wrong side, it doesn't matter. Yeah, they go on the wrong side of the road, it doesn't matter. And they zigzag and cut you off from the traffic, it doesn't matter. But the first person who is able to lift their hands or lift their voices and somehow show that they are much more powerful than you, that's the person yeah, who justifies his act by putting you, making you the perpetrator. Here, the Pharisees are doing just this. They have so many things wrong with them. They have a plank on their eye, but they don't want you to know that they have a plank on their eye. They know that they have a plank on their eye to deceive you, to make you confused, to you know, make other people think that something else is wrong with somebody else, not with them. They take the first stone in their hands. You understand this? That is what Jesus is talking about. Think about this. Do we, are we people who have justice on our side? Do we have people whom, who are right or are we wrong? And if you are wrong, are you trying to do something so that the person who is on the right becomes the victim? If that is the case, Jesus says, that is a no-no. You are not a part of the kingdom of God. You understand this? So it is not about judging. It's about judging for your own, because you have a concern for yourself. It's not out of the concern for other people. You want to safeguard yourself. You are selfish in your deeds, and you are an exploiter, but you don't want other people to say to you that you are an exploiter, so you start abusing the other person even before somebody else, else notices that you were at wrong. You were in the wrong. These kind of people, they don't have a part of the kingdom because you will be judged the way that you judge other people. Who will, you know, look at this. This is a passive voice. You know, Jesus says this in the passive voice. Do not judge or you will be judged. What's the subject of the second part? Do not judge. Who's the subject? Yeah, you don't judge, right? Other people, right? So they become the objects. The second part of the sentence, it's in passive voice. You too will be judged. Who is judging? Who's being judged? Us, right? Who is judging? How do you know that? Where is it there? That's why it's in the passive voice, okay? Otherwise, God would say, if you judge, I'm going to judge you, right? Yeah, he's saying, he's, it's not about God. It's not about, you know, it's not about some kind of karma. You know, sometimes uh, even Christians believe in karma. Do you know that, right? You do something bad, the universe is going to th throw that back at you, okay? So we don't believe in that. Here, it's not about God. He says, what you do, people are going to do back to you. Just think about that. You live in a world where you do good, and you are paid back evil. If you do evil, there is all the more probability that much more evil is going to be given back to you. You understand this? If you judge, he is saying, if you exploit, if you, you know, inflict pain on other people, if you are incriminating other people when you are at fault, know that there are going to be much more bigger perpetrators than you are. You understand that? That is what he is saying. You might be a small dada, kind of, right, in your own street, trying to, you know, get your ways done and, uh, and exploiting people, but you know what? There's going to be somebody else bigger than you, and they're going to exploit you much more. This is what Jesus says. In the world that you live in, it's not even about God. Here he's talking about even in the world that you live in, if you are a person like this, if you keep on incriminating people, you understand you will fall into the same thing that you are doing to the other person. What you do, you will be getting back from people. And you have no part in the kingdom also because you do not have the kingdom values. This is a pharisaical hypocrisy. May God help us that we will not be, we will not do that. You too will be judged the same way he says. So may God help us that we will not be doing that. And that is why he says, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Again, the passive voice, not God, okay? What you do, People are going to do back to you. So may God help us that we will not be people who go about incriminating people, who will exploit other people's vulnerability so that no one will know that we are the exploiters. Do we fit in somewhere? Maybe not in a grand scale, I don't know. Maybe even smaller scale? Think about that. You know, are we the first people, you know, even in an argument, you know, are you the first person who raises your voice, right? Because that's what is heard all the time, right? And that's why sometimes preachers have to raise, raise their voices. You have a weak point, you have no basis at all, you don't know how to substantiate what you got, got to do is scream it, okay? Because that's going to get, <laughs> you know, people are going to say, hey, that's very authoritative. It doesn't have to have a biblical basis, right? 
All that you need is shout. The point is, we do that all the time. We are the exploiter sometimes, but we have the audacity to say, hey, something is wrong with you, because I am the first to point it out to you. So I don't want to remove my plank on my eye. I want to look at the speck in your eye. Jesus says, if you judge like this, know that you will be judged the same way by someone else. You have no part in the kingdom. This is the, hypo this is the pharisaical hypocrisy. You understand this? All right. Then, do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. This is kind of humorous. What is he talking about? Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw, to, uh, throw your pearls to pigs. And this is a kind of a very familiar Hebrew literary device that they use in most of their poetry. It's two sentences which talk about the same thing. So this is called parallelism, okay? Two sentences parallel to each other, and they mean the same thing. They are not two different uh, things that they are talking about. So don't uh, give to dogs what is sacred. Don't give to pigs what is a pearl, okay, something that is precious. So it's all the same. So what is Jesus saying here? And he's obviously not talking about dogs and pigs. He's talking about whom? He's talking about people, right? Jews called non-Jewish people, they are called pigs. They are called dogs. You know why? Because for us today, you know, we have a totally different understanding. Dogs are much more precious than human beings for most of us, right? <laughs> That's the modern way it is, right? Uh, uh, domestic help has to sit on the floor, the dog can sit on the sofa and watch TV. <laughs> but for them, that was the least of the least. They called the Gentiles as pigs and dogs. And now Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He says, you know what? Who are the pigs and dogs? Pigs and dogs are those who are not able to know the value of valuable things. Who's he talking to? He's talking about the pharisaical hypocr hypocrisy. This is what Jesus would do. You know, he was, he was good with language, let me tell you. You call other people pigs and dogs, and Jesus said, you know who, who, re who that pigs and dogs are really are? It's not them, it's you. You know why? Because you don't know the value of the right things. The dog does not know the value of a pearl or something sacred. The pig does not know the value of a pearl, right? And they are not going to appreciate that. So if the first thing is incrimination, the second thing he is talking about is ingratitude. You don't know, even know the value. Jesus has been spending his life teaching the Beatitudes, teaching them the kingdom concerns and kingdom values. And you know what these people did? For them, it had no value at all. And Jesus says, don't be a person like that. Don't be a person like that who devalues everything that is of value. And he says, do not, look at that, do not do that. You know, he gives a command almost, do not do that. And he goes on, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces, right? Really? You put a pearl before a pig and it's going to say, hey, this is not food. I'm going to turn against you and tear you to pieces. Now, Jesus would use this uh, kind of, a, uh, what is this called? A device, a literary device, which is called, what's that? Is it real or is it exaggeration? Uh, hyperbole, okay, so it's an exaggeration. Jesus would use that often to make a point, okay? So obviously a dog is not going to say, hey, this is a pearl, you gave me, you know, this is, not a, this is not something that I value and therefore I will bite you and kill you. No, he is using a hyperbole. What he is saying is, these people, Pharisees and the religious leaders are like this. And he says, you be careful to the disciples, you do not, so this, is, this is very important. We have concern for everybody, right? And we, have, we should have concern, so much concern for people, where we should be able to say, I'm going to lay down my life, if it's going to make a difference in your life. That's why Jesus died, right? That's why most of the disciples died. Most of the missionaries, you know, died as martyrs. You know why? Because they thought that their lives, even if they lose their lives, that's going to be of some value, some benefit to the people who are killing them, right? So that's lofty, that's good. Jesus did that, he taught us that. But we also need to, as much as we have concern, Jesus also says, you have to have discernment. And that's why he taught his disciples, you go to a town, you go with good intention, you, you proclaim shalom, you proclaim peace, you go and give the kingdom values to them. But knowing what you are saying is right, but they don't want to value it, and they reject you, and they want to do things against you, Jesus would say, these are statements that Jesus said. You know what he said to his disciples as he sent them two by two, remember that? 
He said, don't take this, don't take a, a bag, don't take a stick and things like that. Don't take extra sandals. You go and any town that you go to, you proclaim shalom. And if anybody invites you, you go there. But if the town is against you, what do you do? Shake the dust off your feet. You went there because of the concern, but you also have the discernment to know that you don't throw away your life because your life is not that cheap. You understand that? You can lay down your life if it's going to make a difference. But you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything extra because if there, are, there might be people, there are people, and that is what Jesus is saying, these religious groups, they know the truth, but they don't want to know the truth. They don't want to understand the truth. They don't want to follow the truth. They don't want to accept that as the truth because they devalue that because it is against them. And you need to be careful, even when you pro proclaim the gospel, that you don't go get yourself killed for the wrong reasons. You know, you don't get, uh, you get killed and automatically you don't become a martyr. Sometimes it might be foolishness. You understand that? Concern is there, but at the same time discernment. Jesus says, there are certain people who want to reject the truth, even though it is the truth, they still want to be against you. They are like these, who? The pigs and the dogs. And be very careful that you do not throw valuables to them. So what is he saying? Is he being, you know, prejudiced against a group of people? No, he says, know that, don't know the reality. No, you have a concern, but know the reality. So this is to the disciples saying, be very careful about the Pharisees, that you don't, you don't throw pearls to them because they know the truth. They don't want to value it. They're not going to be grateful to you. In fact, they're not going to harm you. You don't do that, okay? So that's for somebody else. I'm not supposed to, you know, go and, and throw sacred things at them. But what about us? Is there a teaching for us? Yeah, there is a teaching for us where it is, don't be ungrateful. Don't have that ingratitude in you. If something of value is given, how many of us cherish eternal life? Tell me. Aren't we like the same? Aren't we the same? You know, how many of us are get excited every morning and say, I praise God because I have eternal life. I have a relationship with God. Anybody does that? When you praise and worship, it's all about what God has done for me, what God has done for me. If he is not doing this for me, I get, uh, you know, irritated, disappointed, angry with God and things like that. You, do you know, we have the audacity to say, Lord, I'm so very disappointed in you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the heights of irony, right? We get disappointed with God. <laughs> what do you do? What, 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 what would God do then? <laughs> We get angry with God, disappointed with God. I've been praying for this, Lord. You, you, you didn't make that happen. I'm so very disappointed with you. You have no right to be disappointed with him. Huh? This is, you don't know what is valuable. The book of Revelation teaches the Christians who are being persecuted. You know what's the true value of your life? It's not the longer video of your life. That's what the book of Revelation teaches. You know, it's not about material things. It's about you having the assurance that you are going to be with God forever. You're united with him in perichoresis. You're going to have eternal life with him forever. Experiencing, enjoying his presence all the time. And that is, yeah, I heard a lot of amen and hallelujah through the congregation. And everybody was saying like, yeah, praise God. Preach it, pastor. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That's the excitement we need to be having. Somebody says to you, you know what? God's going to, as you walk out of the doors of the church, you know, God's going to give you a miracle. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Someone is going to give you an Audi or something like that. Yeah, that's going to be like, hallelujah. Aren't we ungrateful? We are. Jesus is saying, there are ungrateful people. Don't throw away precious things to them. The son... But we also learn a lesson that many a time we are that. We are ungrateful people. We don't cherish. And that is why. That is where we get tired of, you know, this relationship with God. Why should I pray? Why should I read the Bible? Why should I? Because we need some kind of a reason. Why should I follow Jesus? Because, because he's not giving me anything. Oh, he's not healing me. He's not, uh, you know, giving me a good job. He's not doing this. He's not doing that. But he gave you something much more substantial that, than that. He gave you his life. He gave you eternal life, relationship with God. So that means we are the pigs and the dogs who don't value what is given to us. If the first one I call incrimination, this is ingratitude. Don't be ungrateful. May God help us that we will not be like that. You know, because that's becoming out of fashion nowadays, right? Cherishing, being thankful. That's, that's, that's not there. But may we who belong to the kingdom, who follow the kingdom principles, have the kingdom concerns. Then... 
chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And uh, to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Again, he is using the same um, kind of a language. He is using the passive voice. Okay. Most of the, these are misinterpreted verses. Okay. We say, ask to whom? Huh? Ask God and he will give you. No, he is not talking about himself. Right? And uh, what is that? Seek, you will find. What do you seek? I have no idea. Knock and it will open. Uh, what? You, ask, you knock at, uh, at the doors of God? I have no idea what that is. He is not talking about God at all. Generally speaking, if you ask, you receive. From whom? From people. When you seek, you are prone to find it. When you knock at a door which is locked to you, in all probability, people are going to open it up and ask you what's, what, they, what you want or so on and so forth. You understand this? So he is talking about general principles of how the world operates. And he goes on. So this is not about prayer. Teaching about prayer, Jesus told that. What did he teach? Your heavenly father knows what you need even before you articulate, ask. So it is not, our prayer is not asking. Okay. And that's why our, 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 our uh, understanding of prayer, you know, we've talked about prayer a, a, a lot of times, you know, we, we uh, have a good series of sermons on that. Okay. So look at the uh, concept of prayer. The prayer is not asking. It's not seeking. It's not knocking at the door. It's for people. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? So he's talking about people, right? And, or if you ask for a fish, will give you a snake. So what is he saying? In the world that you live in, even though people are not really great people, you ask, you receive, you knock, you, things get open to you. And look at the statement. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So it is not really about even asking. You know, it looks like there is a problem here on, in the understanding of God himself for people. Somehow people have misunderstood that God is not good, that you have to really pester, that you have to really go and, you know, uh, 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 disturb him so much that he's going to say. And that is why we use, uh, you know, the parable, the same parable uh, that we like again about prayer, about persistent prayer. You know, the persistent widow, remember that? Uh, and uh, the persistent widow, he, she goes on asking and, uh, to, the, to, the un, uh, to the wicked judge. To the wicked judge, you have to give me justice. So she keeps on persisting and she keeps on doing that. And one day this man says, oh, I'm so tired about this woman, you know, keeping on asking this. And therefore, I will. And we use this to talk about God. And that parable is not about God. It's about a wicked judge. You understand that? He says... Even a wicked judge will have some goodness. Won't I, God, have goodness in me? That means you have misunderstood me. That is the question. That is the, that's what Jesus is trying to say here. That many people, even in his times, these Pharisees trying to you know, prove something, instead of, and, and why don't good things happen to people? Why don't good things happen to people? Uh, again, coming back to the social aspect of things, okay? Why don't um, uh, uh, people get enough to eat? Huh? Maybe they don't work. Maybe that's one. Okay, but not that's not uh, reality all the time. That'll be just one person, maybe or less than that. Why don't people get things to eat? Uh, right. So it's all about exploitation. I exploit. I take all the resources that belong to everybody. You know what? Recent study says that 1,300 people, in the 7 billion people on the earth, 1,300 people put together, they, they have 94% of Earth's resources. Sounds odd? Check it, whether it's true. 1,300 people have 94% of the world's wealth, leaving 7 billion minus 1,300. I have no idea what that is. It's a long number. Those people are left with 6% of Earth's resources, out of which we have millionaires and we have people who don't have anything. You know why? But you know what? For all this, who's the cause? According to us, the one up there. Lord, why are you 
allowing people to suffer. I have so much concern for them, and therefore I pray for people who are suffering because I have so much concern, you know? And he doesn't have so much concern. And my inaccurate understanding of God, putting all the responsibility onto him for the famine, for people being malnourished, for people not having anything, when I am a part of an exploitative community, and I am also an exploiter, maybe not in uh, you know, the grand scale, but in a smaller scale, but I'm still an exploiter. I will not share anything that belongs to me. I will only pray for you when you have a need. Yeah? And uh, on WhatsApp, you know, sometimes I just wonder. When I say, when we say, you know, someone puts a message saying, hey, you know, this is happening to me. Everybody says, hey, I, I, let's pray. I'll pray. I'll pray. Do you really pray? I have no idea at all. That's a very easy answer to give. Let's pray. Uh, sounds very spiritual. You have a need. You're hungry. I'll pray for you. Right? Because that's going to somehow appease your, uh, uh, right? So it's going to satiate you. Somehow it's going to fill your stomach. Right? Because my prayer is so powerful that, you know, God is going to fill you with everything. God will not create new resources. Know this. God does not. Some of you are looking at me very quizzically. <laughs> I am no, I know what I'm saying and I stand by what I'm saying. He doesn't create a new planet every day. He doesn't go about, you know, replenishing all the resources that we keep on using for ourselves and exhausting. He doesn't go about patching the ozone layer every time we do something, does he? He doesn't. Yet we have the audacity to say, hunger because of him. He says, if you evil people are able to do good things for your children, how dare you call me evil? where I am supposedly the villain sitting up there not giving you anything. Why don't people receive things? That's because of the exploitative, religious, social people up there who are not allowing you to receive anything because they want so much for themselves. But when you come to them, they're going to tell you, God is the answer. So anyone says to you, Jesus is the answer, just ask them, what is your answer? I know Jesus is the answer, right? Yeah, sometimes, you know, things that we can't do, he is still God. We have no doubts there. You understand that? But when someone is hungry, someone doesn't have food, someone doesn't have the basic necessities of their lives being met, and you have the audacity to go and say, you know what, God will do that for you. You are portraying God as the villain who knows your need, who knows that you are squirming, you, you, squirming, you are suffering, you don't have food to eat, and somehow he is sitting there, not doing anything, and you all, what, what, all that you have to go and say is, you know what, God is going to give that to you. You know, you, that's because maybe you prayed less. Pray more. Okay? Maybe it's, it's like uh, Elijah, uh, in a very humorous manner, he's talking to the prophets of Baal. Remember that? Where Elijah says, what does he say? Shout. Yeah, maybe he's sleeping. Shout more. That's basically what we are saying to people. You know what? You, you, you don't have this. Maybe you're not praying, you know? Maybe your prayer has not reached him. Some of there has come some kind of interference. We have no idea, okay? Because prayer is some kind of a Wi-Fi signal, you see? Right? And uh, there are a lot of interference. Maybe the devil is, you know, doing all those things. We will never take responsibility. We will either put the responsibility on God or put the responsibility on the other person that we know. <laughs> Anything that we do, the world is messed up. You know why? The devil did it. Ah, we have no part in that, you see? But most probably, think and understand, we might be devil's minions. <laughs> we might be the ones. Inaccuracy of understanding God is what prompts Jesus to say this. If you evil people are able to do good things, won't I, who is God, who is good, who is holy, do things? But if I am doing things and somebody is not receiving, if I have created all the resources in the world for everybody to eat and somebody is not able to eat, somebody doesn't have you know, the food on their table, is it because of God? But the religious leader who says, it's all because of God. You know, there are people who say that, adversity. Why is there famine there? You know what, because God has allowed it. Let me tell you, God does not allow evil. He is good by nature. He is holy by nature. You know what holiness means? 
What's holiness? He is away, far away from evil. There is no evil in him. And uh, to, to add to that, he's also described as good. He's not just holy and being neutral, no evil from me, but he is also the positive of him being good. But we have the audacity to say, what can I do? God gave, God took away. <laughs> That's Job in the Old Testament. He's a good man, but sorry, his, his theology is a little bit problematic there. God doesn't take away. Does God? Does God? You're confused? God is meaning, He has given us the resources for everybody. We don't receive. That's not on God. That's on somebody else. That's what I'm saying. You understand that? And the devil is also not squandering all the resources. You know, building some kind of a castle in, you know, hell. He's not doing that. Who's squandering all the resources? And we have the audacity to say, you know what? Maybe God is not answering your prayer. Maybe God is not you know, doing this for you. And we are making God the villain. And that is definite, deliberate misunderstanding, misrepresentation of God to people. Who does that? The man who's driving the most luxurious car. He's say, saying to the person, who's that person? You know, most people are probably a religious leader because... Yeah, that's, that's what you know, gets you a lot of clout nowadays. Or maybe you're a politician. And that's the person who's going to, with all concern, say to you, God is going to do that. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't have that inaccurate understanding of me. He's very, very, you know, look at that. Look at the harsh words that he says. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts, I, or the Father in heaven, he definitely will give, or rather, how can you ever say good things don't happen because of God? All good things are because of God. The air that we breathe, the life that we have, the health that we have, the food that we eat, good things. Who are they from? Who created all those? God. Evil that we face, who created that? Not God. Us. We. We. You understand that? Good things come from God. Bad things come from us. But we always turn the things around and say, you know what? God allows that. God allows. No, he doesn't. He doesn't want anybody to suffer. He doesn't want anybody to perish. If at all, that is a reality. That's a reality that we have made. It's not the ideal of God. It's not the plan of God. It's not the will of God. You understand that? And just because he wills it does not automatically make it a reality on earth. This is also something we understand because we are free creatures, right? And if at all evil exists, that's because of free will in his creation, not because of the creator. It could be caused and influenced by the devil, again, a free creature, and caused in most probably by us who are free creatures, not by the creator, but by the creation. But, you know, there is a possibility, or rather these religious leaders are looking at people and saying, you know what, God is not going, doing this for you, and Jesus is angry and he says, how can you do this? And then, look at that, look at the next sentence, it is not a next paragraph, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. And our rendition of this verse will be, do others before they do you. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's today's tradition. Okay, you be very careful. So before the, first, the other guy hits you, you hit them. So problem solved. No one is going to hit you, right? Do unto others what you want them to do to you. In what context is he talking about? In this context, in the same paragraph. Meaning, he's talking about the goodness of God, he's talking about the evil people, and how, you know, certain people are not receiving even the things that they want. And he says, so, if you want those people to receive, it's going to come from where? God created everything. You don't own anything. You don't want the land. You don't want the resources of the land. You don't want anything. How I many of you know that? We are hardcore capitalists. We believe in the Bible, but we still believe that. The land belongs to us, the water belongs to us, the air belongs to us, the trees belong to us, everything belongs to us. You do not create anything. It all belongs to him. And he put people on the earth, his earth, his people, his earth belongs to 
us. Not just a small us, it belongs to everybody. So Jesus says, if people are misunderstanding God, if people are looking at God as villains, maybe there is a problem with you of how you present God, so do to others what you would have them do to you. So, if you want somebody to feed you when you are hungry, even before you go through hunger, you feed somebody who is going through hunger, and then the perspective, the perception of them, for them about God is going to change. Do you understand that? But that's becoming difficult for us. Because the easier way out is, God's going to take care of your problems. That's the easiest way. That's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's a false statement. You can't, you see, understand this. This is, this is, we think it's spiritual. It is not. It is anti-God. It's anti-scriptural. Okay? Should we pray for people? You're confused now? <laughs> yeah. But prayer is not just words. Prayer is action. You pray more for somebody who's in need, the more you give, you become the answer to your prayer. It's as simple as that. Jesus, that is what he's saying. If God needs to be considered to be good by the people who are undergoing problems and you as a religious leader have the audacity to say, hey, the responsibility is all on God. He says for that to change, that inaccurate view of God to change what you do, so do to others what you would want them to do to you. And this sums up what? For this sums up the law and the prophets. And he's talking to this Jewish crowd. And uh, for them, you know what the Tanakh is? What's the Tanakh? You don't know? Okay, they, for them, the Bible has three parts. Their Bible had three parts, right? One is called the Torah. The other one is called the Nevi'im, okay? Which is basically the law. The first five, five books of the uh, Bible are called the law, the Torah. And then the prophets, they call even the historical books, they call it prophets. Okay, it's called Nevi'im. And the, the, the miscellaneous books, kind of. You know, they are called the writings. They are called Ketubim. So, Torah... Nabim Ketuvim. So the first word of each, right? Ta, Na, and Ka, they put together and they said Tanakh. Tanakh would be the Hebrew Bible, right? You understand that? But for the Jewish mind, the writings were just miscellaneous writings. And miscellaneous writings, you have Psalms and Proverbs and Song of Songs and Chronicles and so on and so forth. But the major part of it are in the Torah and Nabim. Jesus says, all the prophets, all the law is about this, about people receiving good things from the world that I created good, you don't stay there in between and squander, take it all for you, exploit everything, and then say to God, say to people, hey, God's going to do that for you. But you're going to say, because the law tells me that the world belongs to everybody. The earth belongs to everybody. Equality is what the kingdom value is all about. So do to others what you would have them do to you. You want other people to treat you well? You treat them well. You know, it's not uh, reciprocal. Might not happen to you, but you are a person who belongs to the kingdom. And therefore, you follow the kingdom values. If someone is, is hungry, it's, not, it's my duty to, if, if I have, I have to feed them, right? But the problem is, somehow our needs, our wants, somehow take the upper hand, or rather, we think that is much more important than the needs, the basic needs of certain people. You understand that? Someone is hungry, and today is my birthday, I want to buy a new shirt. And most probably we're going to say, you know what? Yeah, my shirt, because it's my birthday. You want someone's need, which is more important? My want. My future, right? I have to save for the future, yes. Like 20 years down the lane, I don't know what's going to happen. And I have to retire, have a you know, great life. Saving is good. Someone's today is much more important than my, my tomorrow. If I have that, then I'm definitely a part of the kingdom. If I don't have that ideology, I'm definitely not a part of the kingdom. I claim to be a part of the kingdom. I claim that Jesus is God. But in fact, I am teaching wrong things about God. Where people are going to say, you know what? God gave them that. God gave, did not give me anything. God gave a uh, you know, palatial house to somebody. God gave all of these things to somebody. But somehow, God is not giving me anything. You understand that? When you testify, be very careful. Never ever say, you know what? I've been praying for 10 years you know, to buy this uh, dream bike. You know, recently I saw a post and you know, I was really upset about uh, you know, a man of God claiming, hey, I had this dream car. I've been wanting that for 10 years. God honored, you know, God gave me that. Someone has been praying for them to eat. They're not able to still eat uh, three meals a day. 
what kind of a god are you serving what kind of a ideology of god are you presenting you think that think about that you understand what i'm saying one crore or two crores car i've been praying for for 10 years hey god gave me that but someone is there praying so that their basic needs would be met 10 years down the lane it is still not met who should blame according to our understanding who should blame god jesus says no 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 you are the ones who are supposed to be responsible there and then people will know that he is good everybody can celebrate that he is good everybody has air everybody has uh, resources everybody has food and everybody is going to say praise god because god is god is good so may god help us that we will not incriminate people to justify ourselves get out escape elude trying to pin it all on other people because we are exploitative let's not be ungrateful people in gratitude i call it let's not be that be discerning of who you know values what and you yourselves value the important things in life and we talked about inaccuracy of regarding god cropping up because of our understanding and our teaching in our lives which can be changed by our right living according to the kingdom principle. So may God help us and let's look to the Lord in practice.